So these are the brand new Pixel Watch 4s, and they've got a boatload of new features, both hardware and software, including one huge new feature not seen on any previous wearable before, satellite connectivity. The ability for these to talk directly to satellites to send emergency messages out, and I'm gonna dive through how all that works. What I'm gonna do is first go through the hardware, and then through the software, and the satellite connectivity pieces, and we're just gonna fly through all the newness. Now the very first thing to know is a new screen. These new screens are 50% brighter than before with a display that is 10% larger and a 16% smaller bezel. In addition, the panel itself is now domed, whereas in the past it was mostly just the glass on top of it. The actual display panel is now domed as well, and you can see that a little bit in certain interactions. It looks nice, I wouldn't say it's game changing, but it is a nice touch. The company is still using Corning Gorilla Glass like before, and it's still 50 meter waterproof like before. Next up on the internals, the speaker is louder than before, just a little bit. They're not saying exactly how much louder, but they say far more important than that is now the speaker is tuned for voice. That comes in handy when we talk about all the Gemini responses, so the voice responses coming out of this. Based on your preference for Korean and Italian food. That will get into a little bit later on. Also, because everyone likes more powerful vibrating things, they've increased the haptic vibration motor by about 15%. That's the thing that does all the vibrating alerts and whatnot. Oh, hey, and just a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting and useful, just watch it all the way through. That's where the good stuff is anyways, the satellite connectivity bits at the end there. Uh, it definitely really helps out this channel and the video quite a bit. Further on the internal side, they've added new processors. And I say processors because Google's always had a dual chip architecture on the Pixel Watch, effectively one for higher profile tasks and one for lower profile tasks. Now with that new architecture, they're saying it's 25% faster, but uses 50% less battery uh, than in the past. So that gets into the battery savings. And you can see right here on the chart down below, they've increased the battery across the board on both the smaller edition as well as the larger edition. But in addition to working on the battery life, they also increased the charging speed. It's now 25% faster than before. It can go from zero to 50% in about 15 minutes. Uh, you'll see there's also a new battery dock. Uh, so this is a magnetic dock. They've changed the charging location to be these little pins on the side right there and it goes into this little charging dock that's magnetic. I can even hold this thing upside down without any issues at all. Uh, super nice little charging dock there. It is of course like the third or fourth time that Google has changed the uh, charging on the Pixel Watch, but I like this new dock as opposed to the previous one, which wasn't awesome, but uh, this one seems improved. Speaking of improved, there is now user serviceable parts on the Pixel Watch. This is the first major wearable to do that. Uh, user serviceable battery and display. I mean, you can swap out your own battery if you want to. Uh, the way that works is that you basically take off the wristbands first, the straps first. Underneath that, you'll find two Torx screws there, uh, T2 Torx screws, so standard issue Torx screws, nothing fancy about that. And then below that, you're gonna find four more screws. And at that point, you can take the battery out and swap it out. And of course, user serviceability is being heavily driven by EU regulations that will be covering these devices here in the near future. So Google does appear to be getting ahead of that a little bit. Finally, there are two more hardware improvements. Now, the first one is relatively minor. It's an improved skin temperature sensor to give more accurate skin temperature readings. But the last one is a dual frequency GPS. Uh, that's something that now allows for greater GPS accuracy and harder GPS environments. For example, in the buildings of downtown Manhattan or even out in the wilderness and the mountains or something like that, dual frequency GPS will help out there. Now, I haven't had a chance to do an actual review of this watch yet in terms of testing out that GPS accuracy. That'll come down the road. So definitely hit subscribe. So when I do drop an in-depth review, you are there for it. Next up, we're gonna dive into the software side of things. In particular, the sport side first with 10 new sport profiles, including pickleball and American style football. Uh, the full list of all those new sport profiles are down there, bringing it up to 50 sport profiles in total. They've also added a new screen mirroring mode, but they're not calling a screen mirroring. They're officially calling it bike real-time streaming, uh, which is very similar to what Apple and Coros and a few others have added, where you have your watch on your wrist and it'll mirror those metrics uh, for the bike in particular to your phone. So you can see those on your phone. If you've got your phone on your handlebars and maybe some sort of bike holder, et cetera, you can see that. It's a handy little feature. The only downside is right now it doesn't have a map page, which I mean, Google, Google Maps, like you, you own the map space. Uh, no, it's not, not there today. So hopefully they add a map page showing where I am. That's probably the biggest thing I want. You will still get churn by churn directions. They'll pop down from the top there's notifications if you're using Google Maps for that. But I want it, I want to integrate it like this. This should be something that Google absolutely owns. In any case, one of the next sport features they've got is the ability to do auto recognition of sports. Now they've always had that in the past, but now they're saying it's AI powered and it's way more versatile than it would have been in the past. And so it's using a combination of on-watch features as well as from the sensor standpoint, uh, as well as cloud-based features to categorize those sports and knows the difference between walking and Nordic walking and mountain biking and regular cycling, etc. And this requires no interaction with the watch itself. You just go and do 
your activity and then it categorizes this afterwards on the app and you can confirm or tweak uh, the categorization as you see fit. And the reason why a lot of this categorization will matter is because later in the year when Fitbit releases a revamped Fitbit app, that will come with a revamped Fitbit coach. And that coach will lean heavily on having categorization of all these activities out there. Uh, we've seen cases like Roop, for example, uh, really needing and leaning on a lot of that categorization and getting very, very good at it. And that is sort of the baseline for doing a lot of the automation around coaching type platforms and services. But that new Fitbit coach isn't here today, nor is that new Fitbit app. Uh, they're saying that'll start off in a public beta starting in October timeframe. Now, I did get a hands-on demo of the new app and more importantly, the new AI coaching features. And I will give them credit. This is by far the most advanced AI coaching bits I've seen thus far. If you look here at the app right there, everything is completely redone. But most notably, every single item has the ability to interact with it and then talk to Gemini, their AI platform, about that component using your actual data. And what's cool is that you can tell it things like you're traveling this week or that that particular hotel gym has a Peloton bike. It'll create the workouts for you and give you workouts for the Peloton bike or for floor exercises. It's super, super fascinating stuff. And it does that based on your training history, your cardio history, your activity history, your sleep, et cetera. Now I will dive into this much more deeply in the October timeframe once it hits public beta. It'll be starting off in public beta for Fitbit premium members in the US first and then expanding out from there. Note that the new UI you see there will be for all Fitbit users starting on later this year. However, the AI powered bits, those Gemini powered bits there uh, for all the coaching will be for Fitbit premium only. Next, Google said they've increased the classification accuracy of sleep metrics. So in particular, the stage classification or phase classification, so like sleep, REM, light, et cetera, by 18%. Again, another thing that becomes important when it gets to some of the automation around coaching and whatnot. But I'll get into sleep metrics as part of my full enough review down the road. Now, the last two pieces of software before we talk about the emergency portions uh, is, of course, Wear OS 6 or something that Google has already announced uh, as part of the previous event on this. And with that, of course, Gemini support as well on the watch. Now, like Apple and others, the Gemini support on the watch does require internet connectivity out to the cloud, uh, but it does seem like the responses it gives here are far more advanced uh, than most of the competitors are, including the way you can interact with this. Uh, one of the Google PMs here did kind of a funny demo where he asked the watch what it thought of uh, my review of the Pixel Watch 3, and particularly the heart rate sensor, and here's what it came back with. What did DC Rainmaker think of the heart rate accuracy on the Pixel Watch 3? found the heart rate accuracy on the Pixel Watch 3 to be industry leading and among the best optical heart rate sensor plots he had ever seen in a review. That's impressive. Like that is, uh, I'm not like a talk to my watch kind of person as I've said in my past videos, but that is super cool. And then last but not least, it has the new material. So again, that's been like beaten to death in the media. Uh, redesigns and tweaks the OS a bit to be a bit more fluid. Like we've, we've seen these demos for a while now uh, and here you can see it as well throughout the watch in the user interface. But the big thing that you care about here is the emergency SOS feature. Uh, so the idea here is that it allows you to go out into the wilderness and do emergency response messaging directly from the wrist with no cellular connectivity whatsoever. So in effect, it's kind of doing the same thing as like a Garmin inReach device would at a very basic emergency response level. And I want to be really clear about that. It's purely for you're in deep crap and you need help. It is not for text messaging or doing tracking of friends or stuff like that. It sounds like that's probably like eventually in the future going to happen, but today it is about emergency SOS features. So I got a quick demo of how this works uh, here. Uh, now I will note we are not in a non-satellite zone at the moment, uh, but the device was forced into the satellite connectivity piece manually to show me how this all works. Uh, what essentially you would do is you would dial 911 like you normally would do. This feature is gonna be available in the US initially. Uh, Google says right now they don't have timelines for worldwide expansion, but Google says to probably look at how they've done the pixel expansion of the same feature on the phones uh, is to see how it'll expand as well on the watch. So you're gonna start off dialing 911 first, if you're in the US anyways. Uh, and the reason being, they want to have the same flow as in the past. So you try to dial 911 um, from your watch, or if it's triggered from like a fall detection, etc. Uh, and at that point, it'll normally try to use cellular LTE connectivity, either on the watch or on your phone, to contact emergency responders. If, however, that can't happen, it'll then offer the ability to do the satellite connectivity option. Uh, now, this is the one notable with the fall detection is that if you do like fall down a cliff and are unconscious, uh, you're not gonna be able to trigger that flow manually. The flow into satellite does require uh, you to manually trigger that. From there, you'll go ahead and specify what your issue is. Are you injured? Are you sick? Um, are you lost? Whatever the case may be. And any other symptoms that you may have before it sends that first message off to the response center. So then it's gonna launch a bit of a tutorial on how to use a satellite flow 
know because the idea being you're hopefully only going to do this like once in your life that you need that uh, so they kind of walk through how to do it. So once it needs to send that first message you're going to orient your arm in the same way that you might have done like a phone or something like that to send an emergency SOS message. It was super easy for me to do to get it in the right spot. I thought the user interface there was really really clean. Uh, the satellite antenna side is actually coming off of the side opposite of the button. In my case you would see this on the left hand side. It's sort of pointing like out towards your elbow away and that's the direction that's trying to find one of the satellites there. They're using geo satellites not low earth orbit satellites and those satellites are provided by uh, Skylo who's kind of like a partner organization uh, that's an umbrella over other satellite companies. Uh, so they would then be the ones that work with other satellites in other regions etc. The message generally speaking only took a couple seconds to send uh, and then you'll get a response back to the emergency response center. Now interestingly here that emergency response center is the Garmin Emergency Response Center or the Garmin Response Center is the official name there. Uh, so they partnered with Garmin for that. So Garmin is the one that's going to take care of all the emergency response coordination on that side. And they've of course been doing that for many many years on their in-reach devices uh, as well as any other devices that have emergency uh, connectivity to it. From there they will be the one that coordinates with your emergency contacts that you have listed as well as escalates to any emergency responders including getting a helicopter to get you off the side of the mountain. That's all the thing that Garmin's been doing again for many many years and is really really good at all around the world. So they've handed off that piece to them. What's interesting is when you're in that emergency response mode, it actually goes into effectively the battery saver mode. So you can get 48 hours on the small watch and up to 70 hours uh, on the large, 72 hours on the larger watch. So it's gonna save as much battery as you can. And they go into this low power profile mode that you can't do anything else on the watch except be in this uh, satellite support mode. You can exit that if you need to check something else, maybe a map or something, uh, you can go ahead and do that. And you can also get back into it if you need to as well, but otherwise you'll be in that low power state. The idea being that you could be there for a while maybe, and so you wanna conserve the battery as much as possible. Now, when it comes to the hardware that's required to do this, uh, they are leveraging the antennas in the LTE version. So you need to have the LTE version of the Pixel Watch, and not the uh, regular uh, Wi-Fi version, if you will, but you do not need to have any LTE service uh, assigned to your watch. Watch. So uh, if you just have the LTE hardware, you're good to go because they're using uh, some of the LTE antennas along with other hardware bits to be able to pull this off. And then when it gets to pricing for the satellite uh, pieces there, I like Apple, basically they're doing the first two years are free and after that they're gonna figure it out, but also like Apple, Apple hasn't figured that out either. Uh, we're on three years now and there's still no charge for the uh, satellite SOS piece on Apple devices. It's still free. Uh, so I think Google is basically just gonna keep on doing that same thing until someone else figures it out and then probably follow their lead. Uh, speaking of pricing, when it comes to pricing these watches, they're staying the exact same as last year. Here's all the prices on the screen there. So that's pretty cool. I appreciate that. Availability wise, you can order these watches today, August 20th, but they will not start shipping until October 9th. So quite a ways from now. Thus again, hit subscribe to expect my full in-depth review, probably closer to that October 9th timeframe. Between now and then though, we've got a ton of new sports tech. This I think will be the busiest sports tech year in years. And I've said that for a number of years, but this year is looking absolutely bonkers. In any case, super, super cool stuff to see uh, the satellite connectivity on this. This is something I've been wanting for like a decade now, and it's awesome to see it. So I think that's such a huge deal in the endurance realm. And that is just super cool to see that here. With that, thanks for watching and have a good one.